Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, I really am proud to be part of uh, this group, uh, thinking creatively and ambitiously about how we can bring curative therapy uh, to patients in Africa and to patients all around the world with sickle cell disease. I really appreciate the introductions that um, Am Dr. Ambrose and Dr. Julie provided in, in terms of the scope of the problem and the numbers of the number of the problem. What I'll talk about over the next few minutes is the uh, strategy that we've been working on um, over the last few years. I will say I've been working on this for over 20 years, and I'm really excited to see uh, the, the, the possibility of this coming into patients in the next uh, six to 12 months. Um, I do have some conflicts of interest, but I'll, everything I'm talking about is uh, coming from my academic lab. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Bao gave a very nice introduction to the concept of uh, genome editing uh, through the use of an engineered nuclease. And we're particularly interested in the idea of uh, repairing or correcting the underlying uh, pathologic variant that causes sickle cell disease using the homologous recombination pathway. <clears throat> and uh, Dr. Gang showed nice data using a single-stranded oligonucleotide as a donor uh, to fix that mutation. We've adopted another uh, type of donor to fix that mutation, and that's uh, delivering the donor template on a adeno-associated virus serotype 6 uh, vector. And so the system that we use is to uh, purify the CD34 cells, the uh, uh, cell uh, marker on the cell surface of uh, hematopoietic stem and progenitor cells, and within um, the population of stem and progenitor cells are the true stem cell. And after purification and culturing in cytokines, we deliver the CRISPR-Cas9 uh, nuclease as a ribonucleoprotein complex, so a purified Cas9 protein complex to a uh, synthetically purified guide RNA molecule with modifications on the end to increase its stability and activity. And immediately following the delivery of the RMP complex, uh, we add an AV6 that contains the uh, donor uh, sequence that the cell will use to repair the break and create the change we want. What we have found is, is that AV6 efficiently transduces the CD34 cells, particularly if it's added within 15 minutes following the electroporation. It, it seems that electroporation assists the transduction or EAT of AAV6. And we found the system is highly efficient in a wide variety of human stem cell types, uh, ex vivo, and I've listed those on the right-hand side. So we want to apply this system to sickle cell disease. And as this audience uh, well, well understands, this is a disease in which a single nucleotide change in this uh, codon 6 of the beta globin gene leads to a single amino acid change, uh, causing the hemoglobin molecule to behave aberrantly in the deoxygenated state, causing polymerization and the adoption of the sickle, or as uh, uh, Dr. Ambrose said, a banana cell shape. And of course, uh, this disease is, has devastating morbidity in all patients and early mortality in all parts of the world. So <clears throat> we have applied the rmp AV6 system to uh, sickle cell patient-derived CD34 cells uh, from the peripheral blood. And in these experiments, the CD34 cells were spontaneously in the blood. Um, and what we found uh, with a fantastic team uh, uh, shown below is that we are able to achieve 60 to 70 percent uh, allele correction uh, of the sickle cell uh, of the beta globin gene in sickle cell uh, patient derived CD34 cells. And when we take uh, when we then look more carefully at the CD34 population, uh, there are subsets uh, that include uh, the global CD34 positive cells or the CD34, CD38 positive, which are uh, markers of the progenitor cells, <clears throat> or using cell surface markers that mark what we think are the true long-term HSCs. What we find is that the, the progenitor cells, the level of uh, HDR correction is higher in the 60 to 80% range, but even in the phenotypic long-term HSC, we're able to achieve a correction frequencies ranging between 50 and 60%. Now, what you can see here is, is that there is, uh, you can 
If you're a glass half full type of person, which I am, you can see that it's highly reproducible. But if you're a glass half empty type of person, you can see there is some variability between patients. And we have, uh, I think, uh, the long-term uh, study would be to understand why uh, different patients have different frequencies of, of gene correction, and that goes to the human genomics interests of this group and many others. Now, the uh, so we were uh, so we're pleased uh, to see that we're able to achieve gene correction in uh, phenotypic long-term HSCs. Um, before we can go into patients, we want to show in an animal model that these uh, do have stem cell-like properties. Um, and so when we take uh, these non-mobilized CD34 cells from sickle cell disease patients, correct them, and transplant them into an immunodeficient mouse, and look 16 weeks later to determine whether we have lost those gene-corrected cells over time, what we find is that uh, the gene-corrected cells are preserved, are, are relatively well-preserved. And this is probably because the uh, cells that we're modifying have a myeloid uh, bias, and the myeloid cells uh, following transplantation seem to preserve the gene-corrected uh, phenotype uh, much more readily. Now, of course, non-mobilized CD34 cells uh, are not in a sufficient number uh, to create a uh, cell graph that we could then use in a in a transplant. So we've moved then to uh, looking at the uh, efficiency of correction in plurexiform mobilized CD34 cells. As many of you uh, know, uh, GCSF, which is used to mobilize uh, stem and progenitor cells in non-sickle cell patients, is the most common drug, but GCSF was shown to cause morbidity and significant and even mortality in sickle cell disease patients because of the activation and a dramatic increase in neutrophils in an already inflamed uh, uh, a person. But plurexifor has been shown to be a safe uh, drug to mobilize stem cells out of the bone marrow into the peripheral blood, where they can be then be harvested by phoresis. And in collaboration with John Tisdale at the NIH, we, uh, he was very generous in providing plurexifor mobilized uh, patient-derived CD34 cells. And in six different uh, experiments, what you can see is, is that we continue to get on the order of 60 to 70% gene correction as shown in the green. Uh, we then get uh, about uh, somewhere between 40, 20 and 40% indels as uh, Gang mentioned, and a few alleles remain unchanged. The important, uh, one of the important uh, points is, is that when we uh, uh, differentiate these uh, cells into red blood cells, um, they primarily uh, generate uh, hemoglobin uh, A. They, there's a small amount of hemoglobin F shown in blue and almost no hemoglobin S after the gene correction process. So we have essentially completely reversed the hemoglobin S uh, to the hemoglobin AF uh, ratio after gene correction. And again, these cells will engraft after transplantation into an immunodeficient mouse um, and uh, generate both uh, and generate multi-lineage differentiation. Now, in contrast to the mobilized um, or the non-mobilized CD34s, these mobilized cells, the gene-corrected cells, um, uh, have a slight uh, disadvantage. But nonetheless, across multiple lineages, we see an overall uh, gene correction frequency, allele gene correction frequency of 30% or above. And if you notice in the lower right panel, uh, in red uh, blood cell, early red blood cell precursors in the bone marrow, as marked as GPA positive, the level of gene correction is actually even higher than 30%. It can be 50, 60% or more. So, as uh, Dr. Gang mentioned, we, of course, want to make sure that the correction process is safe. And so we have uh, looked at um, the potential of off-target indels and the potential of genomic rearrangements. And as um, uh, Gang mentioned, uh, using a high-fidelity Cas9, we find a very good uh, profile in terms of uh, uh, molecular genotoxicity with only a single off-target site having measurable indels, uh, what we call off-target one, 
And this uh, site is 85,000 bases from the nearest gene and in a place of no known functional significance. In collaboration with Richard Frock, uh, who developed a unbiased uh, method of looking at potential chromosomal rearrangements, what we find is, is that the uh, frequency of translocations between our on-target site and the off-target site one goes down by about 35-fold when we use the high-fidelity uh, Cas9. And so uh, we think a, a safety profile that looks uh, really excellent from a molecular standpoint. Um, so as part of our process of uh, achieving an IND, we um, we uh, have tried to we have begun to scale up the process. And here I show six different uh, runs done in our GMP facility at a medium scale. So several hundred uh, tens of millions to uh, a, a couple hundred uh, to 150 million cells per run. What you can see is, is by scaling up, uh, we have lost a touch in our gene correction frequency, um, uh, mostly uh, because uh, we, our unmodified allele frequency has gone up. Um, but nonetheless, we are still achieving between 40 and 60% allele correction, which results in somewhere between 50 and 65% of the cells having at least one allele corrected. We'll note in, some of you may be carefully noting that in runs three and four, our allele correction frequency is lower than 40%, but I'll note that these were products that were quite poor and had significant red cell contamination. And it highlighted to us the importance of start, your starting material being of high quality. When we uh, then performed a FDA-approved uh, GLP tumor nigicity toxicology study, taking a full human dose and transplanting across uh, tens of uh, immunodeficient mice, we saw no evidence of abnormal hematopoiesis or tumors or any evidence of toxicology from the uh, putative drug product. Uh, it's kind of hard to show uh, no data, I mean, no toxicity, but there was no toxicity. So with this in mind, we are now uh, beginning our full-scale IND enabling engineering runs. In fact, uh, our first of three is uh, starting, is undergoing this week. And we hope to move uh, to file an IND in, later this year and enroll what we believe will be the first patients who will receive a gene-corrected autologous hematopoietic stem cell product uh, in either late 2020 or early 2021. I will note that um, the materials for this that we've been able to obtain from our CMO and our providers um, have, will be enough to treat um, thousands, if not ten thousands, of uh, patients, um, and thus the cost of goods is actually significantly lower than I thought. And in contrast to what Emily Turner asserted, I actually believe that ex vivo therapy is now at a place where engineering improvements will actually make it cost-effective and will become scalable worldwide. And I will note that in India, for example, the cost of a matched sibling donor allogeneic transplant has been reduced to $10,000 to $20,000 20, per transplant. And an allogeneic stem cell transplant is significantly more complicated than an autologous stem cell transplant. So with that, I want to just thank uh, all the fantastic team that I've been working with over the years, both in my lab, in my division of pediatric stem cell transplant regenerative medicine, my colleagues in the GMP facility, and particularly want to thank the NHLBI Cure Sickle Cell Initiative for funding some of this work and the California Institute of Regenerative Medicine for also funding uh, of this work. And with that, I will stop and we'll move on to the next speaker. Thank you very much for uh, allowing me to present.